The presentation will be by Mr. Nalin Gunasekara. It will be online from Australia. Let me introduce Mr. Gunasekara. Uh, Mr. Nalin Gunasekara obtained his BSc engineering degree in mechanical engineering from University of Peradeniya in 1969. And he obtained his postgraduate degree in chemical engineering from University College of London. He has spent the past 38 years in the upstream oil and gas exploration and production industry and has specialized in monetizing challenging offshore fields in, with leading international projects. His expertise includes project management, concept studies, techno-economic feasibility studies, sensitivity and risk analysis, value engineering and contract negotiations as well as EIA reviews, insurance and legal reviews. He has won the Technical Excellence Award from Royal Dutch Shell for a floating system, which is noted to be a global market trendsetter in this particular field. So over to you, Mr. Nalin Gunasekara, presenting to us from Australia. I'm, I'm speaking from this office of Neha, which is um, engaged in advising clients in the performance of oil and gas assets, which include floating systems like FSRUs, FPSOs, etc. We have about 80, sorry, 70 plus engineers here. And so it's uh, probably the most appropriate place, place to address you on. And as you know, this place is we are the largest uh, LNG producer in the world, along with Qatar, we produced uh, 75 million, 75 uh, MTA, MTAs last year. Qatar has produced 70, about 75, and with a total of about 300 to 350, the total LNG production in the world. Mr. Gunasekar, yeah. now we can see your slides. So I'm yeah. seeing your first slide, uh, which says peak as asset performance. Yes, we haven't moved beyond that. No. Now, so uh, now you can begin your uh, formal presentation. And yes. unfortunately, since we are running behind schedule, not because of your problem, uh, we will have to stick to the 25 minutes uh, that's on the schedule. Thank you. Okay. Um, just see about the next slide then. Yeah. <clears throat> now the CB, Chairman CB has announced that the tenders will be called by FSRU is about Wednesday. So there are, there are, you need to know that there are very few FSRU projects reaching fruition. It averages only about 22 to 3 years a year, when more than 50 to, 50 to 100 are seeking them. Now, there are seven FSRUs laid up. So you might want to know why. So this is what I'm going to reach now, because I have been in this business now 25 years, and we've, we've, we've been around the most parts of the world. and. And there are lots of reasons as to why we, they are not reaching fruition. And of those FSRs which, are, which have been deployed, my voice is not very good today, and <clears throat> not all of them are working to meet expectations. So the, now also the, the dynamics of the LNG market is changing given the rapid the change in downturn, which will give a different risk posture to the entire LNG industry. Now, we've been listening to uh, the, we've, been, we've been having discussions, you know, with Woodside, Chevron, and Shell here, and they've been giving us a lot of discussions here, meetings going on, as to what the transition is going to be, and that is extremely uncertain. So anything what I say is only today's snapshot, which is going to change tomorrow. And <clears throat> so this would mean, uh, you know, a lot of changes, and the risks are still extremely uncertain how this LNG market will change. I'll get on to the details later on how LNG is competing with the other, other primary energy sources. And as you know, 2050 is a target to, to go zero emissions. And so there is some degree of acceleration taking place in the other sectors and LNG is not really keeping pace with them. So that has to be borne in mind. So just to give a feel, feel for these, uh, these projects, now this project is going to cost something about between 300 to 500 million, this FSRE which you are thinking of, which is about the right number that Ruchik came up with. 
So we just get on the next slide. Yeah, the next slide. Yeah. Then we do that. Yeah. So this is a, you know, we live in a litigious society here. So this is a disclaimer, and um, you're supposed to read this. And you know, I'm not. Uh, this is to safeguard myself. So, <clears throat> so as I said here, I've been in this protein production system business for a long time, and uh, the information is not professional advice and it's not to be acted on as such. So it may not be current, current and could be subject to change. Now, <clears throat> now this is a complete presentation I have in mind, but since time is short, we'll have to cut short this thing. So I'll, now I'll, I'll, I'll go through some of the similar projects to Sri Lanka or rather the, in the region. And I'll emphasize on the pre-sanction phase, FID phase, which Ruchi give a very fine explanation, you know, description of what, what we have, what we encounter today. I'll try and reach that point, what the challenges and the hurdles that you're going to meet in reaching that, 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 that milestone. So, and why, what you need to know is that these are, there are pre-sanction lessons to be learned and post-sanction in operation and termination because although there are 30 to 35 facilities in operation, not a, not only not not all of them are performing to expectation. Now, if you have time, I'll go into those those aspects of it. Now, these you have to know that these are very high risk and high reward business. And I have some educational videos. If you have some time, particularly of the 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 the, the CBs, uh, the the the. the, the the tower yoke system that was shown because that was really supplied by by my previous company. So I know that system extremely well. So if you have time, that will be very useful because the last time I was in Sri Lanka, people came and told me that they were trying to evaluate a system that they did not understand. So let's hope that there is time for it because that, that can generate a lot of questions which I probably can answer. <clears throat> now I'm also going to include a glossary on this website so that you can refer, refer to that because that will explain a lot of the terminology that's been used because these are specialized terminology. And I'll refrain from giving information which you can get from websites because that you can always Google and get. And also from consultants elsewhere because the, the information I'm giving you, it's kind of, you know, it's because a lot of this information is proprietary, which you don't get from uh, outside sources. And we have been saying, you know, we don't dispense that information freely. So I'll try to confine to those, that, that's, that sort of information, which is not available elsewhere. Now, this is, I, I, start, I thought of starting this, with this, this particular slide, because I was told that the decision had been made to locate an FSRU by the jetty near the, you know, near the, in this location by Sojit. So let's, and this is a video which you, I would like to show because every oil company shows this video before we get into the LNG business. So because LNG is a very high risk business, LNG business. The gas is highly, highly explosive. And I've been in three, you know, I was, I was the project liaison engineer for Shell's largest gas project in Sarawak. Then I've done two other gas projects, so I need to I need to show this video. I was talking roadside last night, so they said you should start with this video because if they haven't been in the oil and gas business, they need to see this. It's only for three minutes. Yes. I haven't seen it yet. Can you share it? It's very slow moving, but you can find for yourself how a gas cloud explodes. 
and we'll try and watch some of these you now what's that vehicle that is moving and watch some of these people come here there's some people walk here around what's this guy walking now what happens watch <clears throat> so it all takes 3 to 4 seconds before these people can barely walk see we okay, can watch that again and that's how dangerous it is some of, a lot of these people didn't didn't survive this happened in mexico you can see that man crawling these none of these people survive so you can see it from another angle now next time this is the same thing but from another and there's another angle which is why Yeah. Yeah, get on to the next slide now. Yeah. So you can see from here, this is not like a, these are not like oil leaks. Next slide here. Please. Next slide. Yeah. Stop it and go to the next slide. See. So if this yeah. So it's it's not a, like oil leaks. No. The previous slide. If, if this FSR is to be located at the entry to the port, could pose a disruption to the entire port's activities. And this, this vessel undergoes flexure in operation due to the hydrodynamic forces acting on the vessel. So this is a very dangerous business. And what I'm saying here is that don't ignore EIAs. Do not delay them. Now, EIA for this FSR was submitted in December last year. It has never, we've had no feedback at all about this FSRU's EIA to from Soji. So, yeah, let's, let's touch on the, the FSRU's in the region now. Now, all regional countries have secured FSRU's already and some are increasing their FSRU fleet and more planned. Now, India has got two, which are one, one plus one, one is coming out uh, towards the end of this year. Now, Pakistan is having one plus another. Bangladesh is having one plus another. Thailand is having one. Malaysia has one. Indonesia has one in Lampung, which I have the video of because I worked on those. And uh, there's one more to, be, to come on. And Myanmar has just got one um, uh, very recently. Now, what is interesting is that LNG has also entered as a bunkering pool per the emission control areas in, 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 which have been defined by I, IMO. And since 2020, there is, a, there is a surge of people looking at this LNG as a bunkering fuel. Now, now, closer to Sri Lanka, India and Singapore have already entered, Singapore has already entered this market of bunkering from 2015. And India is going to get into this market with their FSRU as well. Now, however, there are many, many challenges in this, bringing these projects to fruition, which I will show. However, they have been overcome elsewhere and, and, and that should not be a discouragement. As, as Ruchit had said, you know, these are, these are doable projects. 
But in the post-pandemic area, it should be understood. Entering this business. Now, these are all the LNG terminals in the world. Is it possible to move that thing? Move that disruption? No, no, no. Okay. Now, these are all the FSRU units in the world. There are 150. Now, most of them are onshore terminals, but the ones which we've been looking at are the FSRUs, where the regasification takes place on the vessel and where the regasification takes place on land. That would be the power generation and the regasification. So, so it's, a, it's a case of developing the most optimal concept between these two. These are the con two competing concepts that we have in mind. Yes. Now you can see how long it takes for an FSR to come to fruition now. Now, India, in their energy policy in 2006, they said, okay, we would have gas in the energy policy. Now, looking at 2000, now this is from 2015, sorry, 2000, yes, 2015, they had six FSRUs planned. But however, by 2020, this arrow should be the reverse. There are only two FSRUs coming on shore at Swan Energy and by H Energy. So, out of the 71.5 gas capacity that they've been planned, you see, all the six have been planned since for two, for it takes, it's taken 15 years for India to get two FSRUs in location, in on station, but they still haven't come on station, but it takes a long time for these projects to come into fruition. And now this is the complexity that you need to know. These FSRUs, it's an offshore mooring which may be disconnectable depending on the harsh weather in monsoons of uh, ice formation. Now, these vessels, as the, the you see, this, this technology is mostly naval architecture and ocean engineering, which is not taught in Sri Lanka. So this is this is not electrical engineering, not mechanical, not civil, not none of those engineering. This is 80-90% of it is ocean engineering and naval architecture. So you can see that you know this, this, this disconnectable mooring systems are pretty complex, and the, the this disconnectable that we showed on uh, for which CEB showed, which is the tower yoke system. There is only one disconnectable other tower yoke system in the world, which I worked on in the early 2000s in the in, in Bohai Bay, and it is disconnectable not for not for harsh weather but for ice formation. So. This, this can be made to be disconnectable. However, it is complex technology. And normally when you engage a contractor to, be, to have a disconnectable system, they have to show that their disconnections have worked in the past. And I don't know anybody who is coming in to show that those disconnectable systems have worked. Whereas the other system, which is, which I will, if, if I have time to show, I will show that, it's, which is a, Submerged turret loading system disconnectable, which is the more popular system, which Bangladesh is using. So there are pros and cons in these disconnectable systems, and they are not simple. Now, because I'm saying that, because Australia has the most number of disconnectable systems, perhaps in the world. I don't know anybody else that has so many systems. That's why we get hired to so many places to to, to advise them on on this mooring technology. Now, I advise ONGC for their very first disconnectable system about four or five years ago in their pre-qualification. So they come to people like us to get, get advice on these, you know, pretty complex systems because they have to work. And, and some of them don't work and nobody know, know, knows about it. So the other thing is that the FSRU may be redeployed or repurposed. Now, as Richard said, this can be redeployed, but redeployment is not easy because when you look at redeployments, I've been redeploying vessels for the last 25 years. Sometimes it takes two to three years to find a home for redeployment. And there are seven FSRUs without homes. All the, everybody is looking for FSRUs. There are so many FPSOs without homes. Everybody is looking for them. So matching, an FSR, matching these vessels for another home is not that easy. So normally they get redeployed only within the same region because I've done two redeployments, one from New Zealand to Brazil, the other one from uh, Australia to Thailand. They were not easy. And most of the redeployments take place within the whole, within the same region. 
Next slide. Now, I think we need to build on our past record and you can form your own judgment to learn these lessons because this is the, this is the lecture on lessons learned. Now, you need to reflect back to the ammonia urea project, which is a very good project. Planned for 10 years, largest investment after Mahabali Group. And uh, we had some of the highest paid consultants in the SDCA. Right? And um, however, it was sold as scrap after two or, two or three years. And there's an excellent YouTube presentation, techno-economic analysis of the failure uh, this, this by, by, by Heshan. And you should really watch this because this is, that just shows how, how planning, you know, with the best advice in the world, we have the best consultants, but still things, things go wrong. <laughs> so the oil hedging deal is another good one. Yeah, I think we paid, you all know more about it than I do. I think, you know, the, the penalty for that was 60 million or 160 million. Price of oil fell from 135 to 41. And the arbitration was in, I think, Singapore. And these penalties for, 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 for LNG could be so much higher. Now, there's a penalty of $1 billion imposed on Qatar by Qatar in India. But we, they, 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 they got a waiver on that. Uh, because of India's leverage, because they have a contract for LNG till 2035. So they are trying to offload a lot of that LNG on a number of people, and they've been talking to various people about you know buying their LNG. So they are trying to get into bed with all, you know, they got tried to get into bed with Bangladesh, they, they should get lost. So you know, you need to be very careful when you deal with India's excess LNG. Now, aircraft leasing deal is another good one. Yeah, I think we paid, we have, again, we have consultants for all these projects, you see. So, and this FPSO leasing deal is very similar because the banks that finance this FPSO, FSRU and FPSO business also, uh, uh, also finance this aircraft business. And these, le these leasing deals are very complicated. I've been in this leasing business now for the last 10, 15 years. We, we, we review these contracts uh, for, for banks. So, I can tell you they are pretty complicated deals. Now, you know about the coal gener power generation plant. Again, I don't know whether you have any, any uh, consultants for that, but you know the, uh, the, the problems we are having with, it, with environmental and uh, power disruptions. Then the Hambantata port and the Matala port. See, coal is banned, very heavy penalty is paid, and mainly economic losses. So the, the lesson from this is that planning is the most critical thing in this business. The more sp time you spend on planning, the better. I'll go into that in more detail because that's better, more eloquently explained elsewhere. So there's a, and the other thing is that you see these poor countries are seduced by very high capital value projects, which nobody understands, both in the public and the government. And these are procured, they are unsolicited proposals. And you know, these are, these are you know, highly complex projects. And there's a lot of misinformation in the public domain due to poor journalism and by self-appointed experts. And India has been having this problem for some time. India has a lot of this misinformation in the, in the public domain. And oil industry, I must say, is one of the most complex businesses to understand. It is, the value chain is pretty complex. If you have time, we'll go into that. I have more, more description on that, but I don't know whether we'll have the time for that. Now, this is an excellent book on confessions by an economic hit band. It discusses how institutions like the World Bank and IMF mislead countries. It has case studies, so many case studies. It, they say it's been uh, translated into 32 languages. And interestingly, Myanmar ignored all this IMF and ADB's advice, which I've been following Myanmar's case because they consulted with us about five, six years ago. And they got an FSRU recently. They, uh, uh, you know, right, right. They did their own, own, own study then developed that project very well. But we don't know whether it's going to work or not. Now, reasons to engage a good FSR is supply. Now, this is like hiring a reliable taxi to go to the airport. It should work. And not all these FSRs work when you want them to work. They are con now, a reliable supplier is concerned over any form of reputational damage. He's very concerned about if his taxi keeps failing on the way to Patanaika, you know that he's, the name gets wrong. <laughs> so 
and they are monitored for the operational record globally because if they if they if these fail they immediately the, the news gets around very fast and they, and that is a is a is a hindrance for them to get future future business opportunities and they are extremely concerned about the hsc record the environmental and health health service and environmental record for their global business opportunity because this is the high profile business today hsc record and they are well funded and it will give the best service and they are most economical because they have a large fleet they have economy of scale manpower spares etc very wide contact and very wide contacts with the business and the most important thing is if something goes wrong sri lanka doesn't have the money so we need to get a reliable good fsru supply that is most important that is invaluable mr gona sekar five minutes more mr gona sekar five minutes more in that case i might just stop them five minutes i i i you know it's no point i just proceed no because then i'll try to get the last next slide no next slide now here this is the one you see now these are the show stoppers deal breakers actually this uh, whole list lesson is not really for any new speakers it's a proper duration you know normally this is given over two hours but uh, you know so the fact this is why this uh, you know why why only two of them stop you see only you get only two to three uh, if fsr is in the world <laughs> every year you see financial security package is is unacceptable you can't have you payment guarantee so the, the it talks yeah the project doesn't proceed any further flagging is the most important thing because the flag, flag of convenience has to be offered the governing law is not acceptable so unless you have one of these international laws it's you know this is there's no use even tendering these things out and this this item any invoice payment has been paid directly to a bank outside sri lanka now i have been on cases where just on this line The, the the project collapse right and the dispute resolution arbitration has to be outside sri lanka and you have to get an unconditional eia a lot of these projects don't proceed without an eia now and the last item which is now your projects i noticed there is no pni insurance there is a need for pni insurance of this of the value of the vessel every one of the projects i have been to i have been to so many projects in the last 25 years They all had PNI insurance because of the catastrophic event. You need to, and the value of the project insurance will be exceeding three four hundred million dollars. And and there are contractors who can't buy this insurance. So, but, so that at that point itself the project. So they, they are they are they are show stoppers. You see, and so so these are things that I would have spent time on. Then and there are more pre-sanctioned invoices. Do not make this project too stale. Stay with the industry standard. I have no time to explain the industry standard to you, so you don't know. Avoid letters of intent. These are banned mainly on major projects because paying early engineering fees to maintain schedule, you know, is is uh, is, is a real trap set by contractors. Contractors hire more lawyers than engineers, and know the hierarchy of documents. These documents are complicated, fancy documents. There are there are ambiguities. intentionally introduced by contractors to make money and consultants remember don't pay penalties those penalties and they disappear immediately after assignment and there are many jurisdictions in charge in in, in charge here there are which i have here all the jurisdictions which i have no time to explain and do not mix energy security with energy uh, energy security with uh, national security because now this is a very important thing now singapore as they don't now they they don't want to be dependent on utilities from malaysia and likewise they don't want to be dependent on energy from from indonesia uh, from their west tuna gas like like europe doesn't want to be energy independent they have to be energy independent with uh, russia with russian gas so now these are very well now right now if you are following the north stream to issue today in europe you will know what this is all about Uh, avoid prescriptive specs and functional specs because contract consultants will write the fanciest thicker specification and and what happens is eventually when they don't perform they will come and point the finger and say 
this is what you asked us to do and now don't tell us and they want that day rate to be paid irrespective of whether the thing functions or not so this is where this is one of the areas where you get caught very easily with consultants and local content in many i have unfortunately i don't have time to explain that the scope of work means i have no time to explain that this last one will take a long time to explain uh, how to calculate level, level, levelized cost of electricity externalities because you have to be project specific and country specific when you use this data from other other sources for renewable energy cold and when you are comparing now you can see here what the how many the entities who are involved in this there are a lot of people this is there are banks insurance companies finance i i would have explained all these insurance and class societies flag state port state coastal state charterer there are so many parties involved in this finally when you know, can remember this is a ship this is not a offshore platform if something goes wrong in a ship nobody is responsible finally you have to pay the fine so this is a dangerous game actually this shipping business is the most dangerous game you can think of because because in the sea finally nobody is responsible because there are too many parties involved now these are these are slides i drew to see how natural gas can be supplied from the fsru also with the power being generated from the fsru there is technology is developed right now and so the fsru can develop gas as well as power and if sir you can develop power only for some pool case so there are various combination in all these cases you can also so there are many permutations and combinations in this business and this is about planning and fortunately cb is now you need to go through all these steps in planning and this is a very valuable graph that shell produce after 100 years in the business and this is in all the textbooks today and if anybody is doing project planning you will see this, see this on their on their wall the project engineer so this so i have no time to spend. i'll i just go into the last slide take peter the take is concluded in 1 minute global 1 minute please yeah it, this project is still global with the right stewardship poor countries succeed ghana croatia cyprus jamaica El Salvador, Malta, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, all these countries have the FSRUs or they've been sanctioned. And secure the FSRU with a supply with a tractor body. If something goes wrong, at least one party should be able to fix it. When buying money in planning, you cannot throw money late and hope to fix problems. Don't rely on consultants. Learn from Sri Lanka's past mistakes. Learn the business. And I want to show this last item. To buy gold plating in the wrong place. Go buy a car with two or three spare parts, spare spare tires. You see, you now STNS is it? Is their 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 proposal showed two process plants. There is no point in having two process plants because those process plants works. The weakest link in that is the rice system. So you must know the business. You must know the rice system, the bore system. They are the ones that fail. Not having so you spend twenty five million dollars on a process plant. Another twenty five million dollars, he doesn't add any value. There's one other slide. Please give me just two minutes to show this, because. Huh? Ah, that one. You see, here are, these are tier one suppliers. These are reliable suppliers of FSRUs, right? These people make effective SOs as well. Now all these have. Eight, ten, eight to ten, eight to ten, two to three, uh, two, two to three. But these people also own the mooring business, so that we used to work for them and move it. Right now, this is what they look for. They all look for credit for the clients. That means, do the first question: Do they have money to pay us? Do do not exhaust contract the good goodwill of like oil majors. They want to see well planned projects. have they planned this properly have they got a proper budget in mind and they look for repeat business opportunities global opportunities so they when they come to somebody then they want to see big oil company yes because they know they got global opportunities yes sir and they are looking for knowledgeable clients people who don't waste their time asking questions and they want to compete only within their own league they don't want basunas coming and comp competing with you know then be major contractors they want to only within their own league they will compete and they only preferably only a co business 
If you want to hire a taxi, don't ask them to go and put up a garage also. You see, but sometimes they will change. Now, El Salvador, they change, the BW changed it. But depends on how, you know, they change their mind. And they generally complete offshore unit without any onshore activity. Uh, that's another thing because they want to concern because anything on show they say oh labor department will come and say oh you have to comply with this some electrical department comes and say oh you got to comply with this so they it's a waste of time for them they want to compete only their co business in the offshore business and they prefer long leases to maintain their share value because they want a long revenue stream to show their to show the shareholders and prefer okay. transfer in the second right? please conclude Sorry, is that all? Yes, can you please go? Yeah, and, and, and these contractors are used to being paid to bid. Now, Woodside was paying last month a contractor to bid. So they are not used to, you know, they want, you want a serious bid, they are used to paying contractors to bid. So that's, I think that's about it. So unfortunately, I couldn't show most of the slides. Okay.